Hey guys, Will here. So today I'm really excited to try something out that I've been wanting to do for a very long time. Now, I'm sure for most of us, anytime we've thought about our ultimate man cave or nerd cave and what it would look like, we've probably at least thought about the idea of having a projector. I know for me, every time I've ever thought about upgrading a TV or you know building a new gaming rig or something like that, something in the back of my mind has always been, you know, would a projector be a better option than a monitor or TV or something like that? Now. I've kind of kept a loose eye on projector technology for a long time now, and every time I've thought about it, it's kind of come down to a couple of considerations. Some of the things that you need to think about are obviously input lag, response time, contrast ratio, brightness, all those things are of course vitally important when it comes to the experience of immersing yourself within content or gaming or anything like that. And while the appeal of a large screen often seems awesome, when you consider all those other little details, often projectors don't seem like quite such a good idea. So historically, there's always been three or four reasons why I've ultimately not ended up going with a projector. So when BenQ sent me an email a couple of weeks ago and asked if I'd like to check out their new TK700 STI projector and basically invited me to test it out in all those scenarios which have typically been areas where projectors fall over, I thought that sounds like something that could be really, really interesting. So today we're gonna put the TK700 STI gaming projector to the test and see whether the game has changed. Let's get going. So let's start off with the most fundamental thing, which is the size of the image that's projected by this. So it is a short throw projector. And one of the questions I asked BenQ was, do you need a dedicated projection screen or any sort of special type of paint on your wall to get a good experience out of this? And they said, no, as long as you've got a relatively low gloss white wall, which is of course what we have behind us here, shouldn't have an issue. So at around 1.2 meters distance from the wall or from your projection screen, you'll get a 60 inch image. If you increase that to two meters distance, that gives you a 100 inch image. And if you're able to get the projector up to 4.2 meters away from the screen, then you're able to get up to a massive 200 inch image. So it is a relatively short throw, meaning you can get quite a large image without having to have the projector miles and miles away from the wall, which should be good. And I'm expecting for the majority of testing today, we'll probably be operating around about the 100 inch mark, which should be good. Now, the other call out features here, obviously we talked about before low input lag. So it is really important again, and we've talked about this before on the channel, but just to reiterate for you guys, the difference between input lag lag and response time. You often do see those two terms used interchangeably. Response time refers to the individual pixels on the screen and how quickly they can respond to changes. Whereas input lag is everything that happens between when you make an input on your keyboard or mouse or controller or steering wheel or whatever input device you're using through to actually seeing a change on the screen. So what we're gonna be referring to throughout this video is input lag, which is the latter. So everything between the input and you seeing a change on the screen. So when it comes to 4K, this projector is able to do 4K at 60 hertz, so HDMI 2. Uh, we'll talk about inputs and outputs in just a moment as well. And at that resolution, we have a total input lag of around 16 milliseconds, so a little bit higher than we have on some modern gaming displays. But I generally find for me at least somewhere between about eight and 12 milliseconds. Anything below that, I don't really notice the improvement. Anything between 10 and 20, I start to see a little bit of a difference. Everybody's gonna vary there a little bit, and there's you know plenty of arguments online about you know what the human human eye is actually able to perceive, but we definitely will be testing that out today. You know, if you do decrease that resolution to 1080p at 120 hertz, that gives you 8.3 milliseconds of input lag. So that's a typical resolution you might find on a lot of consoles. And at 1080p on a PC, we are able to get a refresh rate of 240 hertz out of this guy with an input lag of four milliseconds. So we'll check that out later on as well. So just looking at my cheat sheet here, a couple of other call out features, 3000 lumens brightness, 96% rec 709 color coverage as well. Contrast ratio is 10,000 to one. So we should get really nice color reproduction out of this guy as well, I'm hoping. We do of course have HDR compatibility too. And a couple of other call out features that they've drawn attention to in their marketing material as well is the different gaming modes we have available for different styles of games, which kind of varies the color reproduction as well as response time on the screen. And then they have made quite a big deal about the audio capabilities of this as well. Not only the five watt speakers in this, which apparently sound quite good, we'll test that out later too, but also the enhanced audio return channel or EARC which this has too. That allows us to take any input that we have going into the projector and pass the audio signal back out of that into whatever sound system we might be running in our studio, home theater, gaming room, or whatever we're doing. So that should work quite well as well. And just quickly on the subject of inputs as well, it does come with the BenQ QS01 Android TV module too. So we do have to install that manually and that gives us full smart TV capability. So you can watch movies, you can watch YouTube, you can run all your favorite apps, just the same as you would on any other Apple TV device. So 
we'll check that out today as well. But let's get this all put together now. Let's get it fired up and put it to the test. Okay, so we've got the projector mounted up on the ceiling now. Went to a local hardware store, picked up a mount for about 50 Australian dollars, so it wasn't too expensive. And look, we did experiment a little bit with different placement around the room, having it off to the side, keystoning, all those kinds of things. We found that having it mounted on the ceiling just kind of worked best for us. Remembering we are in quite a small room here, and we wanted to get the projector as far back as possible to get that nice 100 inch screen. So we needed, as we said before, about two meters of distance back from the screen to be able to get that 100 inch screen. So you can see here on the, top of the projector here, or bottom of the projector, I should say, because it's inverted, you've got this plastic line here, which is like a cutoff. And if we spin around and have a look at the screen, you can see these different configurations here. So if we have it mounted down low, that cutoff is the bottom of our screen, and then everything else throws upwards from there. So you can imagine if you have the projector two meters behind you, and then you're wanting to sort of sit in front of it to play your games or do, you know, watch your movies or whatever, unless you're sitting off, the, off on the sides and the projector's kind of between two people or something like that, you're always gonna have problems with casting a shadow on the screen. Whereas you can see in the configuration that we have it here, our cutoff is at the top and it's actually quite a short throw there. We are actually able to get in quite close to the screen without casting a shadow, which is really cool. So I'll quickly run you through these calibration settings now. So we've got front projection, front ceiling, which is the configuration we have rear and rear ceiling projection as well. So if you have a screen that you can project from the rear, that is quite useful too. So we're gonna go front ceiling, choose English as our language, and then we have a really handy automatic keystone setting here too. Now, what I would always recommend to people is, you know, don't use keystoning as a compensation for a bad installation. The, the aim is to always not need any keystone. And as you can see here, we've actually got this completely zeroed out and no keystone whatsoever. Now, one really important point to note with this projector is that you can't run any keystone when you're in game mode. And the reason for that is that they're trying to keep that latency down as far as possible. And anytime you have keystone, it's actually having to do, I guess, post-production or image processing on what's coming in from your PC or your console. And that, of course, is going to add latency and lag. So we want to try and aim to have as minimal keystone necessary as possible. And as you can see here, we've achieved that, but we can just go up and down here. You can see if the projector were mounted closer and on an angle, we can compensate from that here. Now, one thing we did find when we adjusted the horizontal keystone to compensate for having the projector offset to one side is we did get quite a lot of distortion in the pixels as well. Some pixels looked a lot bigger than others and that's to be expected as well. Obviously, we, you know, we're manipulating the image to kind of correct it rather than having it correct to begin with. So that makes sense. And then we also have keystone for rotation as well as you can see here, but we're gonna keep all of that zeroed. Everything looks like it's pretty well organized. We hit confirm. And then we also have a couple of different game modes that we can choose from between off first person shooter, role playing, SPG. Then we also have a fast mode adjustment here, which we'll experiment with a little later on too. We'll leave that off for now. And I'm gonna set this to first person shooter, which I think is probably gonna be best for what we're testing first. So before we move on, just a quick note about the flickering that you guys will be seeing on camera. Now, because we're running different lights in the room, we're trying to get you know enough lighting on my face and everything else as well. We are gonna get a little bit of flickering on the screen. Obviously that's not visible when you're actually looking at the projector in real life. It's just a synchronization issue with the camera. So we've done our best to minimize it, but it's impossible to get rid of it entirely. So just wanted to note that for you guys. But before we get through into console and PC connection, let me just run you quickly through the Android TV interface. Standard Android TV interface here, so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time here. So we can click to type in our search commands or we can also use a voice search as well. And we do have a voice search function on the remote here too, which is quite handy. And then basically it's just the normal apps that you would expect to find. This will obviously vary depending on your region too. So yeah, there's not a whole lot of need to go through the entire Android TV interface today. But one thing I did just wanna quickly call out is you can cast to this as well. So if we bring up a YouTube video here on my phone and then we go cast, I can cast it directly through. And you can see it pops up YouTube straight away, shows up as linked to iPhone. And there you go, that's one of our recent videos there playing on the screen quite nicely. So it all works really seamlessly. 
it was only a couple of seconds to get that up and running and yeah, just works really well. So we've got some footage running here from one of our recent videos, just with some natural lighting kind of conditions to give you an idea of what the picture quality is like. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But I wanted to firstly just talk about how close you can get to the screen when it's mounted on the ceiling as we were talking about before. So I'm only a meter, maybe one and a half meters from the screen right now. And you can see my hat is just getting into the bottom of it there. If I move back just a touch, then I'm completely clear. Now this is way closer than I would ever actually want to sit to a screen this big in real life. So normally I'd probably actually be about twice this distance back from it. So just wanted to give you an idea of how far back you can get from this and how it impacts it. So you can see as I lift my hand up, I'm starting to cast a shadow across the screen now. But yeah, up till that point, it was absolutely fine. Now, just in terms of color reproduction, everything you can see here, you know, the differences between the blacks and the bright colors there, that's, you know, sunlight coming through. Very, very natural color reproduction. This looks very similar to how it looks on the PC or even on my TV screens as well, watching this footage on the main TV. But yeah, just really natural color. It doesn't look too vibrant. doesn't look washed out. There's not too much kind of contrast or anything like that going on. It's very, very natural color. So really impressed with it you know, from this perspective. Now, obviously we have to be careful with the footage that we're showing in the video. We can't show movies and things like that. We can only show our own footage. But let me just fast forward quickly to some outdoor footage in this video as well. I'm just driving along in natural light. We'll just skip forward. And you can see again, the differences between the dark areas and the bright areas outside, very nice. You're not losing too much contrast in the dark areas. And yeah, just overall, it looks really nice. This is obviously just, you know, relatively small sensor camera as well. So you can see the sky was blowing out a few times. That's more in the footage than anything else. But no, it looks really clean, looks really nice and very happy with how it looks from, a, I guess, a home cinema kind of perspective. So let's get it hooked up to the PC now and do some gaming. So we're up and running on the PC now. I just wanted to put a test pattern up on the screen to show you a couple little details here. So come in nice and close. And what we're wanting to pay attention to here is the slight rainbow effect that we're getting above high contrast white areas. It's pretty uniform across the entire screen. If you look up at the numbers up the high here as well, you can see the same thing going on, even just above the area here. And particularly, I guess noticeable when we've got these high contrast lines that are really close to each other. Now the reason for this is basically just down to the way a DLP or digital light processing uh, projector works. So with a conventional LCD projector, what we do is we split the light out into three separate beams. It goes through three separate uh, LCD panels, one for each of the three colors, RGB or red, green, and blue. And then it combines it back in again using a prism system and then sends it out through the lens. Now, one of the downsides of an LCD projector is you do have to have a really bright light source because we do have polarization filters for each of the LCD panels. And that obviously reduces the amount of light. It pretty much halves the amount of light that transmits through. So basically what it boils down to is the light source has to be about twice as bright with a uh, LCD LCD projector as it does with a DLP projector to get the same overall brightness on your screen. Now DLP or digital light processing technology was developed by Texas Instruments. And it, this is just something that blows my mind because it's like the scale just, it, it's hard to get your head around. So let me just explain exactly how this works. So basically you're taking a light source again, you're shining it through a color wheel. So it's basically a wheel with the full spectrum of colors like what we have along here spinning around really, really quickly. And that's actually one of the reasons why DLP projectors can be a little bit more noisy than others. But basically you've got a color wheel that's spinning around really fast and you've got the light reflecting on an array of tiny, tiny, tiny little mirrors, one little mirror for each pixel. Now, when you think about the context of a 4K projector, that's over 8 million individual mirrors, which are all able to be independently controlled electrostatically. So what's happening is each of those mirrors is able to switch on or off basically by changing its angle electrostatically again, of course, and that allows it to either send the light out through the lens or send the light off into what's called a light dump, which is basically just like a black area inside the projector that absorbs all the wasted light. So it's important to understand that unlike what we would have on an OLED monitor or TV, the individual pixels aren't switching off or on. It's much more like an LCD TV or a monitor in that sense. The light source is always present. We're just able to switch those pixels on and off individually. So you might be wondering, okay, if it's a mirror and it's either on or off, then how are we able to get darker grays? How come we don't just sort of have light and dark. Now, the way it's able to achieve that is absolutely crazy. If we have a look down here, what's actually happening in these gray areas is the mirror is flickering basically. So it's flicking on and off extremely quickly. And that allows us to be fooled into seeing a darker amount of light. So if you compare it to the pixel above it where it's white, what's happening here is that mirror is flicked into the on position constantly 
whereas the mirrors directly below it where this gray area is are flickering really, really quickly. And that's part of the reason why you might see a bit of a flicker on the camera, but you don't see it with your eyes because their eyes aren't able to perceive that change quickly enough. And if Tom increases the shutter speed on the camera, what we can see now is this kind of rainbow effect going on. So what you're seeing on the camera is actually that color wheel being slightly out of sync with the camera. So you're actually able to see each individual color rather than the combined spectrum of colors which you get when you look at it with your naked eye. So when you combine everything together and just think about the number of pixels, the number of mirrors that we're using in such a small area, the fact that we're actually able to control those mechanically as well, so just flick them on and off electrostatically, and then you know, have that all synchronized with a color wheel that's spinning around. And then on top of that, able to have all of this work, take the input signal and have everything happen with a response time of 16 milliseconds for 4K or four milliseconds for 1080p. Pretty mind blowing, at least in my opinion. So I thought I'd just sort of share how that works. Obviously there's a lot more detail available on this online. You guys can do some research and read further stuff, but I thought I'd just give you a quick rundown on how it works. But anyway, let's move across from the test pattern now. I just wanted to show you that slight rainbow effect because it is something that might bother some people, but it is pretty pretty consistent across most DLP projectors. It's just kind of like a characteristic. Okay, so we've got Cyberpunk 2077 running here, about to raid the Wraiths camp. And we're just gonna walk around a little bit, just talk about the experience of using the projector in general. We'll try it out a couple of different resolutions too before we get into some combat down the hill in just a moment. Now, we're running at 4K at 60 frames per second right now. And one thing of note is that this projector doesn't have any sort of adaptive sync technology. So we are gonna to have to rely purely on V-Sync. Now, we have that switched off at the moment and you can see as I move around here very rapidly, you can see a bit of tearing up in the top sort of quarter of the screen. You can see the clouds kind of slice a little bit down the bottom as well. About, it's pretty much thirds that you can see there. If I scroll up and down, you can see that quite profoundly. So it's a little bit distracting, but look overall, the response time is pretty good. If I quickly jink the mouse from side to side, it doesn't feel laggy by any sense. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the equipment to do a scientific input lag test. We do have to rely on their numbers. Remembering again, 16 milliseconds for 4K 60 Hertz as we're running right now, uh, down to four milliseconds at 1080p. But we do have that little bit of tearing there. So let's just quickly enable V-Sync quickly and that should hopefully get rid of that. We'll set it to 60 Hertz, 60 frames per second cap as well, 38, 40 by 2160 4K resolution. And I do have the graphics cranked down to sort of medium to high settings just to try and sort of maintain that 60 frames per second. But you can see now not getting any sort of nasty tearing at all. And again, the lag doesn't feel particularly profound. It definitely, I'm noticing the drop from the 165 Hertz that I'm used to running on my gaming monitor compared to this. But I wouldn't say it's, it's impeding just walking around or anything like that. But we'll, we'll go down the hill now and get into some combat quickly. And then we'll drop the resolution down to 1080p at a higher refresh rate, 240 Hertz we should be able to achieve. Right, I'm in position. I have you in range. And see how it looks. Now, when I crouch down, we do actually get that vignette effect going on, but I'm gonna go through the pipe. And that vignette is in the game, I should say, not, not something to do, to do with the projector, but let's go through the little tunnel here, crouch down. And again, the transition between bright areas and dark areas is very smooth. And just overall, whoops, we're gonna get out of the view of this guy. Just overall, I wanna say that, I guess the biggest thing I'm noticing is just when you're looking at reflected light as opposed to the, a bright light source like a PC monitor, it does have this kind of soft and smooth, natural kind of look to it. It's funny, because it's not as, it's not as sharp as a, as a smaller PC monitor as you would expect, because obviously we're making the pixels larger to stretch them across a larger viewing angle. So the, um, the pixels per inch or the um, dot pitch is a lot larger, but it has this kind of natural, smooth, cinematic kind of look to it, which is actually really nice. And I mean, just even up, just looking at that dust storm as it rolls over the mountains, it's, it's a different experience, but it's actually a really enjoyable experience. So let's, get out of crouch again now and let's uh we might just start some combat i know we're supposed to try to sneak in but we'll fire off some bullets and see how we go with input lag now i'm gonna tell you ahead of time i'm not the world's best first person shooter player so i apologize in advance but not really the point of what we're doing here we just want to have a bit of fun so let's shoot some guys in the head
Come on. So, yeah, I'm able to move around. I'm able to kind of, you know, keep my mouse locked on where I need to be without too much drama. It definitely feels less smooth than the 165 hertz that I'm used to, but, I mean, we expected that at 60 hertz. And it's definitely no different, at least from an initial impression, to running 60 hertz on a PC monitor. I definitely wouldn't say that this feels, you know, laggy or anything like that. Let's get out of the way here. We're almost dead already. <laughs> Give ourselves a moment to get our health back. Yeah, no, it, it definitely feels the same as running on a 60 hertz monitor, I would say, a, a relatively modern one. So I'm not feeling any discernible input lag. I'm able to track components and kind of keep my mouse locked onto them relatively well. Whoop, watch out for the Molotov. Whoop, we're dead. <laughs> That's okay. So running at 1080p now with VSync off at 240 hertz and immediately things feel a lot smoother, even just on the desktop, moving the mouse around. I mean, I think that's probably one of the things that people notice first and foremost when they change refresh rates on their monitor. You notice the smoothness in the mouse and it makes a bigger difference than you generally think it would. But just here now, I mean, I commented before running at 60 frames per second, 60 hertz in 4K, that the input lag wasn't really all that noticeable, but I'm definitely noticing the drop now down at four milliseconds as opposed to the 16 milliseconds as per the spec sheet. I'm remembering again that we can't measure it ourselves, but this absolutely does feel smoother. I am noticing the drop in resolution of two, of course. Remember, I'm sitting a lot closer here than I probably would if I was playing under normal conditions. I'd probably be you know, twice the distance back and it wouldn't be quite such a big deal. But when you can see in details here just little bit of a jagged edge on some of the pixels. You can see that aliasing effect starting to happen. But again, perfectly fine, perfectly playable, but I'm definitely noticing the both the, the extra smoothness. We're not getting any tearing or anything like that, even though we are running VSync turned off. That's because we're able to maintain that 240 frames per second at 1080p with our 2080 Ti that we're running here. And I have cranked the graphics settings down slightly as well, just to ensure that we don't drop down below. So yeah, just definitely a much smoother experience overall. So let's get into a combat situation again, just like what we did before, right, and see if we find the experience to be much different. So we'll go through, and we will try some other games out in just a moment too. We'll put together a bit of a montage of footage and probably give you a bit of a summary of the experience across a lot of different types of titles, but I thought this was a good opportunity to test this out. So let's get in there. We'll do the same thing we did before. Hello. Okay. Oh, gotta watch this guy. We're going to be dead pretty soon. <laughs> it's definitely easier though. Like it, it's, it definitely is easier to lock onto targets. And I mean, as I said before, it's kind of, it's kind of like you don't notice the difference until you're experiencing it. Like, I mean, if I'd only experienced 60 Hertz, I would have said it was fine. But now that I have the 240 Hertz, I kind of don't want to go back to the 60. So, oh, geez, he's keen. How many shots can these guys take? Far out. It's the end of him. But yeah, I'm definitely not struggling as much under combat now as I was before. Yeah, there we go, we're dead. <laughs> All right, well, what we, might do, what we might do now is jump into a couple of other titles, have a look at how they go as well. And yeah, we'll come back, we'll do some sim racing, we'll do some flight sim as well. Definitely as a first impression, the trade-off of resolution versus refresh rate, I'd say most people are probably gonna wanna run at slightly lower resolution, given if, you, assuming that you're gonna be further back from the projector. And you know, take advantage of that higher refresh rate and lower input lag, because that really is at four milliseconds, that is completely indiscernible. It's every bit as smooth as the one millisecond monitors, at least in terms of my perception that I'm used to running and definitely not a factor in terms of responding to what's going on on screen.
Liam. All right. So it's sim racing time now, and we're running at 4K60 again. I've left the wheel and hands on the screen as well, so you guys can kind of get a feel for the input lag. Now, there may be a little bit of animation lag as well, but from Tom reviewing a little bit of footage that we recorded before this, he said that it didn't seem to be particularly noticeable, but I'll let you guys be the judge of that. But what I can tell you from a driver's perspective is that I'm not noticing any amount of input lag to the point where it's sort of diminishing from the experience at all. We will give this a shot at 1080p at lower, obviously 1080p lower resolution, higher refresh rate as well, with a lower input lag of four milliseconds as opposed to 16, just to sort of see the difference. But I'd say overall, this feels smoother than first person shooters did. And yeah, I don't feel like it's impacting my performance here at all. I don't feel like there's anything missing, but I'll let you guys watch for a little bit too. It's cool kind of having the large perspective with the field of view too. Now the field of view is not absolutely set up perfectly, of course. Ideally, we'd want to have the projector screen a little lower than it is now as well. But I mean, this works just fine. I'm kind of adjusting my perspective And I'm able to drive, you know, just fine within my comfortable limits here. Now, obviously, one of the big questions people will have is how does it compare to large triple triple screens? And I'd say, you know, it's nowhere near as immersive as that. For, for starters, you know, even if you were to extend your perspective to the same, you know, field of view as you have with triple screens, the fact that it's kind of all in front of you as opposed to wrapping around you definitely takes away from the overall immersion and the sense of depth as well. One of the things I commented on when we moved to triple screen to the massive triple screens initially was that even though we don't have any stereoscopic effect, even though you know it is still a two-dimensional screen that we're looking at, the fact that we're able to have the screens wrapped around us to an extent does kind of put you inside the car and immerse you. And this isn't as immersive, you know, to the same extent, but it's definitely more so than when I used to run the 55-inch TV on its own on the rig, if you guys think back to a couple of years ago when that was our configuration. So this is definitely the kind of setup I could see, you know, having mates over for some casual sim racing experience. I don't think that I would recommend this over, say 27 inch triple screens for the more hardcore sim racers, simply because you're not getting that same immersive wraparound perspective. But, you know, for a casual gamer and for somebody that's wanting to have you know, a kind of, the kind of system where they can enjoy a bit of everything, enjoy sim racing, enjoy first person shooters, watch a movie and have all of that on a large screen. This is absolutely doable from a sim racing perspective. So let's drop down to 1080p at 240 hertz now. Drop that input lag from 16 down to four milliseconds and see what the impact is. Okay. So yeah, I'm not noticing for me, and again, you guys can see for yourselves the difference in animation and input lag between what you're seeing my hands do and what the wheel's doing, but to me, it doesn't feel significantly different like it did in the first person shooter kind of context. So. I kind of felt like with first person shooters, I would want to run it at the lower resolution and the higher refresh rate to really get the most out of the overall experience and sit a little bit further back to compensate for the pixel density. But with this, 
I would say I would probably run it at 4K 60 and be happy with it. Whoops, got a bit of a bump there. I mean, the, the difference in resolution, given that I'm sitting a little bit further back here with the rig a little bit further back, isn't super profound. But the difference in input lag is almost indistinguishable to me as well, I would say. Maybe a little bit sharper on the response, but I mean, it could just be placebo. There's so little in it, at least to my senses, that I really don't feel like I'm being advantaged by having the higher refresh rate, I would say. So from there, I think it might be time to chuck it on the old Xbox and see what the experience is like with some console gaming. Okay, so I guess to summarize the experience with the TK700 STI so far, look, absolutely has exceeded my expectations. As I mentioned at the start of the video, every time I've kind of thought about transitioning across to a projector, maybe using one as a replacement for a TV, whether it be for, you know, gaming or for just watching movies in general, there's always been something that's kind of held me back from it, whether it be, you know, the lower contrast ratio, pixel density over a larger screen area, refresh rate, response time, all of those things have kind of been, I guess, setbacks for projectors historically. But Honestly, the experience with this thing has been absolutely brilliant so far. While I wouldn't say that it is a replacement for a conventional gaming monitor or a triple screen setup for sim racing, I would definitely say that, you know, if you're looking for some sort of a hybrid device that's able to give you a fantastic experience from home theater all the way through to gaming, maybe you're somebody that has mates over all the time, plays a lot of multiplayer games, particularly things like FIFA or football games, things like that, this works absolutely brilliantly. We really didn't have any problems with input lag whatsoever. We definitely could tell the difference between the um the 4K 60 hertz resolution at the 16 millisecond response time and the 1080p at 240 hertz with the four millisecond response time. And one thing I really wish we had that we don't have with this projector is a 1440p resolution at around 100 to 120 hertz. I did actually try to set up a custom resolution using some tools in Windows as well as some aftermarket software as well, but I wasn't able to get that working. Maybe we'll see a firmware update in the future that will allow us to do it, or maybe it is just a limitation of the HDMI 2 to protocol that they're using on this particular projector. I'm not sure on that, but I feel like 1440p at 120 hertz or so would be a really good middle ground between 1080p at 240 hertz and 4K at 60 hertz. So for sim racing specifically, I really felt like 4K was fine at the 60 hertz refresh rate. I didn't really feel like the input lag was an issue at all there, but for more precise first person shooters, and I think particularly for competitive gamers, you are probably gonna ultimately want to run at the lower resolution just to up that refresh rate and up that response time, will lower that response time, I should say. The projector does have an inbuilt sound system, which is actually quite surprisingly good for what it is. But look, I mean, I think that in the context of just whipping out the projector quickly to play a quick game or maybe watch a quick TV show, maybe at a conference or some sort of a group situation where you're wanting to use a projector, yes, it's absolutely fine. It's loud enough to get the job done. But I think for, you know, for a home cinema experience or for a proper gaming experience, you're really gonna wanna connect this up to a proper sound system. And of course, you know, given the kind of money that you're spending to get this projector, most people that are in the market for something like this would be looking at getting a sound system to go along with it as well. Now it does have the three and a half mil stereo jack for audio output as well as the enhanced audio return channel. And that allows us to pass through Dolby and DTS 5.1 or 7.1 surround. We also do have the game sound mode or as BenQ are calling it, Cinema Master Audio Enhancer. And that does enrich the treble and bass output. But again, I think if you're connecting this up to a more high-end sound system, you're probably gonna end up leaving that turned off and fine tuning your sound system itself.
So the inbuilt speakers do work quite well for what they are, but of course it is great to see that enhanced audio return channel as well as the stereo jack for audio output. Now one other thing here that we were really impressed with was the performance on console. We plugged in Tom's Xbox One. Now I'm not an avid console player, I haven't really played much at all, but Tom does spend quite a lot of time. So he did quite a bit of extensive testing on FIFA 2017, which is a game that he's played an awful lot. Now he used to really complain a lot about input lag on a, it was, old, it was an old Sony Bravia. TV he used to play that game on and he would actually go and plug in a gaming monitor specifically to get away from the input lag because it really did diminish the gaming experience so much but he was very happy with the experience on this projector didn't have any issues at all there and yeah it was all plug and play there was no issues with resolution detection or anything like that we just plugged it in everything just worked straight out of the box and yeah everything was exactly as you would expect but yeah look to answer the big question which I guess is you know can you use one of these projectors for gaming what's what is the experience like in 2021 with a gaming projector absolutely blown my expectations out of the water this thing uh, it really is very 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 good the contrast ratio is really great as well uh, it, it's kind of always funny with projectors because you're looking at a white wall but then suddenly the white becomes the black as your reference point because the rest of everything else is also bright but you know in a dimmed room the contrast ratio is fantastic. You know, obviously in situations like what we're doing right now, where we do have to have a bit of foreground lighting for the camera, you do start to wash out the background a bit, as you can see here. So if you are sort of working in an environment where you do have to have a brightly lit room, that's obviously gonna change things quite a bit. But if you are in an environment where you're able to dip the lights down, then you will get really great contrast ratio, really great color reproduction out of this. And yeah, I think if you're in the market for a projector, then this is definitely one to check out. I can't comment too much on alternatives because I don't have experience with them, but I can definitely give you a big thumbs up for the TK700 STI from BenQ. It's, uh, it's a very, very good projector and it's definitely exceeded my expectations. So I hope this video has helped you guys out. And uh, yeah, we'll definitely be using this a little bit moving forward on the channel as well. Would like to integrate this into some of my secondary sim rig testing and things like that. Maybe do some gaming, maybe even do some streaming using this as well. I think that could be quite a bit of fun. So really looking forward to what we can do with this projector. Thanks again to BenQ for sending it through to us to check out. And if you do want to pick one of these up, we do have an Amazon affiliate link down in the description below as well, which helps the channel out with a small commission from every sale so thank you very much for the support there and yeah let us know in the comments whether you found this interesting as well it's a little bit of a step away from our usual type of content here at the channel but i thought this would be something that you guys would find interesting it is something that i see coming up quite often in the uh in the comments on a lot of our videos why don't you use projectors instead of those triple screens so hopefully you guys have found it interesting so leave a thumbs up if you have liked the video make sure you're subscribed as well so you don't miss future content from the channel and we'll see you guys again soon bye